people used to think, oh, you can spend six or eight percent every year because that's on average what the market has returned. But what that six or eight percent doesn't account for is, you know, a really poor what's called sequence of returns. And so if you, uh, you know, happen to retire just before a severe market downturn, that six or eight percent is going to have you running out of money in maybe 10 to 20 years. Welcome to episode 49 of the Student Loan Planner Podcast. Today, I've got Leaf joining us, and Leaf is one of my good friends and also has an extremely unique story. So before I give away too much, let me turn it over to you, Leaf. And Leaf, welcome to the show. Thank you, Travis. It's uh, great to be chatting with you once again. So I am a 43-year-old retired anesthesiologist. I say I retired from medicine. I don't necessarily call myself a retired person since I do run a website, which is one of the reasons we're here talking today. But I just finished up my uh, work in Minnesota about two months ago, almost now, and moved to Michigan, and life is good. That's really cool. So your, I don't know, stage name is not the right word, but blog name, internet name? I like moniker. I like the term moniker. Moniker. The position on fire, yes. Yeah, so your moniker is this, this the position on fire. So does that mean that you you know were in an operating room one time and your white coat caught on fire? What does that mean exactly? You know, it wasn't the white coat because I only wear scrubs in the OR. But uh, no, actually, there you know we can go back to the uh, great propane grill disaster of 2012. But actually, no, the term fire in <laughs> this case is a reference to uh, financial independence. Retire early. That's an acronym. And uh, it's been tossed around quite a bit, you know, with different fire blogs. Uh, And a lot of us put more emphasis on that financial independence piece, which means you have enough money to be able to afford to do what you want to do with the rest of your life without relying on any earned or active income. Yeah, that's really interesting. So when you say retired, I mean, what does that mean? Does that mean you're going to senior centers and playing bridge? Or what exactly does that mean? What stage of life are you at right now in terms of that kind of thing? Well, there's bridge, but then there's also sheep's head. You've got shuffleboard, right? Uh, I'm sure there are beaches that uh, have not been uh, you know, explored by <laughs> us yet. No, you know, to me, it's just, well, I did leave my anesthesia job. And I could go back in the next, I would say, one to two years if I decide that uh, this new life isn't for me. So I do plan to keep an active license and will do what I need to do to have that continuing education and maintenance of board certification. But I don't anticipate doing that. So what we have planned, I'm married with two children. They are now 11 and almost nine years old. They've been eight and 10 for the last year and now they're having birthdays. Yeah, so we plan to do some uh, big time traveling. We're going to spend a couple months in Ecuador. We're actually leaving next week, coming back for the holidays. Then we're spending a couple months in Spain, uh, January through March of this coming year. And we've got a one month cruise plan to China after FinCon, a uh, conference where I'm sure I'll be seeing you next fall. So, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of what we're looking at for the next uh, year or so. Some big time family slow travel. So, Lee, this is where the pitchforks are coming out. And I can hear the listeners right now. They're saying, Travis, you idiot. You know, we have six figures of student loan debt and you have this guy who must be, you know, a multimillionaire. Uh, who is, you know, going on cruises from like America to like Asia, you know, uh, how does this relate to me, right? So don't worry if that's you, listeners, we're going to address all of those concerns because I want you to have the option to be in Leaf's situation one day if you want that option, right? So I don't necessarily think, Leaf, that you don't think that you have to retire you know, to have a better lifestyle with a profession, right? So a lot of, of your friends in the profession that have you know, had some some desire to be financially independent, like the white coat investor merely reduced their hours. What what are your thoughts about that? Right. Well, that's the beauty of financial independence. It allows you to do, it just gives you options to kind of live the way you want to. And, you know, we actually achieved financial independence four to five years ago. And for the last roughly two years of my career, I worked part-time and I would actually squeeze in all of my clinical work into one very busy seven-day stretch every month, and then I'd have a few weeks off. We kind of got to uh, do a little trial run with the type of travel that we wanted to do, and that went really well. 
you know, a lot of people will drop the worst parts of their job. You know, for the white coat investor, that's Dr. Jim Dolly. Uh, he's an emergency medicine physician, and he dropped his overnight shifts and he stopped working holidays. Another, you know, friend of ours, Peter Kim, he's got a site passive income MD. He also has cut back clinically. I think he's working about 40% time. And again, he has tried to cut out as many of the nights and weekends and those more onerous shifts from his schedule. And some of the criticism that I hear about that kind of setup is that, well, these are shift working physicians, right? So, you know, you don't hear a lot of surgeons doing this or a lot of people in more traditional seven to five type healthcare roles, maybe like dentists, you know, maybe you don't hear as many people trying to do that. What are your thoughts about some of those criticisms? Are they warranted or are they uh, unwarranted? It is certainly easier when you work a, uh, a type of job that you don't have your own roster of patients. You don't have a lot of follow-up with patients. Uh, it's just simply easier to work a shift. Now, there are locum tenens opportunities for physicians in really every specialty, and that can be a great way to work less, work when you want to, and take time away when you want to. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have to be a little more creative. It can be tough to, uh, you know, find a part-time schedule with maybe the job that you have right now. You might have to leave. You might have to find someone else willing to share a job with you. You might have to negotiate with your boss, with administration, and you might have to, you know, think outside the box. But usually where there's a will, there is a way. Yeah. And so one question I've got for you that a lot of the listeners are probably wondering is, as a physician, presuming that you drove a decent car with a roof that didn't leak and probably two or three bedrooms to sleep in that had heat and air conditioning, right? Is that accurate? <laughs> All of those things are accurate. I actually upgraded in the last year to a 2017 Nissan Armada that can haul 8,500 pounds, which would be a nice size RV. We don't have one yet, but we do plan on getting one. Okay. So you do not live like a pauper. One question I've got for you is how would you even stop working? Like, okay, I'm a dentist or a veterinarian or a physician or a chiropractor, or, you know, lawyer or something like that listening to this. How does somebody go from having their wages cover their expenses to not working at all way before you can get access to retirement accounts? Walk us through exactly what that looks like from a math perspective. Sure. So this kind of goes back to the definition of financial independence. And and for this, we'll ignore the fact that I actually do make some money with the website that I have. But we would be able to do what we're doing with or without that. And we've been in a position like that for a little while. So financial independence, as I kind of mentioned, it means that you can live uh, off of your investments. It can be a combination of passive income. You know, if you're into real estate rental properties or you know small business ownership but it can also be just uh, strictly based on net worth stocks and bonds that you own in your investment portfolio uh, as far as getting to money before the age of say 59 and a half when you can get to your IRA 55 when you can spend money from your 401k there are different accounts uh, for me it's a 457b that's one that many physicians and other high income people may have access to if they're W-2 employees, and that can be spent at any age after you leave your employer. There's also just a simple non-qualified brokerage account, also called a taxable account. That's just when you buy mutual funds off the shelf. And I have a Vanguard taxable account that actually has about half of all of our assets uh, sitting in that, and that's ready to be spent whenever we want to access it. So what does that mean, taxable account? So let's say that I have $100,000 in this mutual fund called VTSAX, which is the Vanguard of it. Yeah, Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund. So, so what kind of money do I get if I have $100,000 sitting in that versus $100,000 sitting in a bank account? All right. So it depends on your actual taxable income that year, whether or not you will be paying taxes on the gains when you decide to spend that VTSAX money, the Vermont saxophone, if you will. Yeah. So if you're married and filing jointly and you have taxable income under, I believe it's $78,400 in 2019, uh, you are in the 0% capital gains bracket. And so you would only pay taxes on the gains if you have state income tax owed. Now, if you are a physician in practice and selling some of those, well, then you're definitely going to be paying capital gains taxes. 
but let's say this is $100,000 that you uh, invested over time, about 50000 and it doubled over time. So your gains are 50000 So you're only going to owe capital gains taxes on the 50000 in gains, not the entire 100000 that you sell. And capital gains rates are favorable. They are anywhere from 0%. Like I said, if you're under a certain threshold, 15% is what most people will pay. And if you earn more than 250000 as a couple, you pay an extra 3.8%. And then if you get up to the top top tax bracket in the federal rate, I think it's about 600000 right now, uh, there's another 5% tacked onto that. So it's a little bit of a detailed discussion, but long story short, uh, it's much more favorable than paying income tax or withdrawing money from a 401k or 457b, assuming those are taxed for dollars. Yeah, so you can get it out kind of with low taxes in, in retirement, but you have 100000 in VTSAX and you get about $2,000 a year in dividend income from that, right? True. Okay. So if you had a million dollars in VTSAX, then you would get 20000 per year in dividend income. That is correct. And that dividend income in that particular mutual fund, which I know since I have quite a bit of that, it is all qualified dividends, I believe. And so you pay the same capital gains rates on those dividends as you would on capital gains. Yeah. So so say you've got a million dollars and 20,000 of, of your you know investments is just coming to you in the form of dividends. That kind of mm-hmm. comes to you regardless of what's going on in the, in the market, right? Kind of can fluctuate, right? Right. Yeah. So the other portion of the return that you're getting is the capital gain, which goes up and down wildly every year, correct? Right. Certainly volatility. You know, VT, SAX is the total stock market, as you mentioned, and there are several thousand stocks in there, all of which are being traded and moving up and down every day. But over the long haul, you know, American stocks, US stocks have gone up in the range of 8 to 10% uh, per year, long, long term. Now, there are certainly thoughts that uh, the market may be a bit overvalued right now. We might be looking at lower returns going forward, maybe 4 to 6% over the next decade is, is what some people who seem to know a lot more uh, about the market than I do are, are predicting. Yeah. So, but in general, like if you had a million dollars, you could probably have 20,000 of it just be deposited in your bank account as dividends. And then maybe you could yep. sell about $20,000 of that mutual fund that would probably be capital gains. Like at some point, you're just kind of guessing to try to smooth it out. A portion of them would be, and you can actually choose which lots you sell. You know, if you bought them just last year and they've only gone up 10%, then you only have on that $20,000, $2,000 gain. And you would only owe taxes on the $2,000 of the 20 that you took. And again, if you're only spending 40000 a year, you're well below the threshold where uh, your taxable income would actually cause you to owe anything in in capital gains at the federal level. And again, we're talking long-term capital gains. There are short-term capital gains on assets you've held for less than a year, and those are taxed at ordinary income tax rates. I should just point that out. Sure. And there's a lot more investments than just VTSAX. That's just one mutual fund that we're kind of giving an example of this. But so, you know, you've got a million dollars in these mutual funds. You're pulling out about 40000 a year by combination of having dividends deposited and actually selling some of those mutual funds to deposit that money in your account. So if you have a million dollars, you can live off of 40000 a year. If you have two million, you can live off of $80,000 a year. And if you have three million, you can live off of 120000 a year. And that's the 4% rule. If the 4% rule of thumb, and that goes back to a couple of studies that were done in the uh, early 1990s, one from William Bengen and then one from Trinity College, both of which kind of lowered the uh, withdrawal rates that retirement planners were using for their people they were advising. So people used to think, oh, you can spend 6 or 8% every year because that's on average what the market has returned, even a combination of stocks and bonds. But what that 6 or 8% doesn't account for is you know, a really poor what's called sequence of returns. And so if you, uh, you know, happen to retire just before a severe market downturn, that 6 or 8% is going to have you running out of money in maybe 10 to 20 years. And if you're going to retire, especially if you're going to retire early, you want your money to last you know, 30, 50, even 60 years. And so a more safe withdrawal rate they found then was about 4% per year, adjusting upwards with inflation. And, you know, even looking more closely at that, like our friend Karsten from Early Retirement Now, who has 
written 30 plus blog posts on the safe withdrawal rate topic. And he's a PhD economist, also uh, got his education at the University of Minnesota at the same time I did, which is a fun fact. But yeah, his series kind of went into the weeds really thick. And he came up with a, you know, maybe a three and a quarter to three and a half percent being a super safe withdrawal rate from Mm. your total retirement assets. Yeah. So in other words, like, so the probability of success for that money lasting you the rest of your life with a 4% withdrawal rate, it's like 90, 95%. But if you want 99.5% or 99.9, whatever, then you need to drop it down to withdraw less to give your investments, you know, more time to an ability to grow and recover from some of these big market downturn kind of events. Is that right? It is. And, you know, if you get through the first five to 10 years of retirement without one of those really bad events, then you will know in hindsight that you could have actually been spending more and you can ratchet that spending upwards at that point because you've really gotten through the uh, period that uh, your plan can most uh, likely be busted. Yeah. So in other words, if I want the probably going to be successful thing, I could do the 40,000 on a million or I could do 30,000 on a million if I wanted to be super safe in terms of what I'm pulling out of that, right? Right. You know, and so instead of 2 million, you could pull out 60. At 3 million of investments, you could pull out 90. And so if that withdrawal amount can cover your spending, then you're financially independent. You can do anything you want to do, including retiring in your 40s. Is that how it works? That is how it works, Travis. Yeah, I'd say you nailed it. And that's if you have no student loan debt at all. So that is, you know, certainly a big caveat that we'll discuss later in the interview. But I wanted to go ahead and have you expose yourself, Leaf, with the truth about how little student loan debt that you dealt with from your medical school education. Are the cameras on? If I'm going to be exposing myself, I think we need to uh, wait. You said, oh, about the student loan. Never mind. Never mind. (laughs) Yeah, I probably should have phrased that question better, you know, but uh, tell us about your student loan experience. So I am a Minnesotan and I decided to accept a full tuition scholarship to the University of Minnesota, a school that both my mother and father and my father's father attended. And I also had a Robert C. Byrd scholarship, a few other private scholarships. And so I got through undergrad with no student loan debt. I know that uh, makes me a poor guest here. But I did decide to stay there for medical school, and medical school, even in 1998 when I started, was fairly expensive. I ended up with about $60,000 in student loan debt altogether. And at the time when I graduated, I remember the average indebted medical student owed about $95,000. So I was at about, I guess, two-thirds of that. Mm. That's pretty interesting. So wife didn't have any student loan debt, did she? Uh, She had about $15,000 and she attended the University of Florida, also her flagship in state school, had a Bright Futures scholarship and worked pretty much full time through school. Yeah, I guess combined we had maybe 75,000 or so when we got married, which was shortly after my residency. Okay. So you took out debt back in the time when student loan interest rates were just ridiculously low, right? I had uh, subsidized loans and I was able to consolidate with the federal government down to about 2%. It might have been just under or just over 2%. Yeah, I was lucky. And I I don't quite understand why that option no longer exists when interest rates and the Fed rate are so very low right now. It's really kind of a shame. Yeah. Well, so we're going to pretend for a moment, you know, to, to kind of stay the pitchforks here. Uh, we're going, yeah. we're going to uh, pretend that you're 18 years old. You've got to do it all over again. So we're going to assume that you have no family contributions. So you're not getting any help from like a 529 or family money or or anything like that. And we can't assume that you stay in state. So I was thinking maybe you know you'd come out with maybe 25k of debt or something like that. You know something kind of modest from undergrad. And then let's say that you go to that same medical school. And again, we're assuming no help and no sort of family contributions. I looked up Minnesota med school's cost today for the rising class. And so it's about, they estimate about $45,000 per year for four years for in-state. So that would be $180,000 in debt with no help. And then I tacked on an additional uh, amount of money for interest growth while in school because the, the student loan interest for grad school is not subsidized anymore. Uh, Also, they're going to raise tuition. They're going to have origination fees. So I tacked on basically an extra 40-ish K 
for those expenses uh, in addition to you know what you'd actually physically borrow. And then if you tack on the 25K from undergrad, that would put you at graduating medical school today with 250,000 instead of 60. So say that we've got LEAF 2.0. Let's say you've just graduated medical school and you've got 250K. I mean, I know that obviously you don't have to think about this stuff because you're, this is not a problem that you or a lot of your readers. No, but I do have kids that will be going off to college here and within the next decade. So I will be thinking about this, certainly. Yeah. yeah, well, that's a good point. So you could take all of that in federal debt and you could have that be the revised pay as you program while they're in residency and you could get an interest subsidy and then you could just refinance it when you finish training. You could potentially take out some private student loans instead while they're in medical school. What are your thoughts? Like, you know, we should maybe go PSLF on that, work for a not-for-profit hospital, potentially make less money. What would be your thought if you had 250000 of student loan debt today? Would you have just tried to pay it off? That is a lot to think about. You know, what I'd like to do is go back to that med school decision, look at that 45000 a year and the, uh, you know, eight years of my life I'd be giving up for med school and residency. And maybe decide to start a blog and a podcast instead. (laughs) But to play along, I will say that my last two jobs in anesthesia were both working as an employee for 501c3. Well, for nonprofits anyway, for places that would qualify for public service loan forgiveness. And they were both good jobs. So I would probably run the numbers. I'd go to studentloanplanner.com, look at the calculator and (laughs) figure out whether or not it would make sense to pursue PSLF with that loan balance and the payments that I'd be making. Find out how much I would be able to have forgiven. And that would probably make sense. If I couldn't figure it out on my own, well, then I'd just get a consult from you, Travis. (laughs) <laughs> well, no, I'd get a consult from one of your uh, one of your employees, right? Because two hundred and fifty doesn't get me talking to you, right? You can still talk to me. It just you have to pay more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, maybe we do that. But yeah, I think uh, you know it's surprising how many jobs actually do qualify for loan forgiveness, and I know that wasn't the intent of the law when it was created to have you know, anesthesiologists making multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars per year have their loans forgiven. But that is what we're able to work with. That's what's out there. That's what's available. And so I would run the numbers. And if I was going to have a substantial amount forgiven, and I was not taking a job just to qualify for that, but it just turns out, like I said, the job I had, which was my my most recent job was my best job. And uh, that happened to be a job that would qualify. So I'd probably go that route. If not, refinance to the lowest uh, interest rate that I could and perhaps refinance again as the Fed rate continued to drop as it seems to be doing now this year. Yeah. So so just a couple thoughts on this. So I think it's really hard for people, especially in medicine, to know if they're going to be in a not-for-profit job beforehand or not. I think a lot of times like people think they're going to be private practice and they end up basically doing a private practice-like function at a hospital. So I mean, I would be very worried about you taking private loans out for medical school uh, just because of that thing that I've seen time and time again where people are, are think they're sure, but then they end up not being sure about what path they take. Right. You know, so I always tell people federal loans are the absolute number one thing you should focus on first in terms of taking them out unless the exception would be if you are 100% positive that you were taking over mom or dad's you know, medical practice in the private sector. And even that's not 100% because mom and dad's mom and pop practice may no longer be competitive you know, right. with this one legislation change, right? And so that might get swallowed up by the local conglomerate that's buying everybody else up or forcing them out of business. So yeah, nothing's for sure. Yeah, and the term private practice, you know, if that's even a little tricky to define. I was one of five anesthesiologists in a small town, but we happened to be employed by the hospital. But if we functioned a lot like a small private practice, we were employed, though, by a nonprofit hospital. Right. The problem is, is for medical school, anything you borrow over $40,000 gets borrowed with something called a grad plus loan. So that has a origination fee of like four and a quarter percent. So it's almost like a load mutual fund in terms of the upfront cost of borrowing. And then also it's got about a 7% interest rate as as well. 
So, you know, if you can borrow Stafford loans, Stafford loans are a 1% origination fee with a 6% interest rate. So probably private loans for medical school would probably be a 0% origination fee with probably around like 55 to 6% interest. You know, for your kind of situation, I think I probably would have taken all federal everything. Right. But, you know, for somebody maybe in law school, in law school, you only have a $20,000 limit per year on Stafford borrowing. If you're really sure that you're going to be taking out a big law job or something like that, you know, then mm-hmm. it might make sense to take out private loans instead of grad plus loans because of that, the zero origination fee or lower origination fee with a lower interest rate as well. Sure, that makes sense. In that profession, there are far fewer jobs that are going to actually qualify as working for a nonprofit. Obviously, there are law jobs for nonprofits, but the percentage isn't somewhere near 50%, which I believe it is in medicine. Yeah. So, I mean, we added some private lenders as advertising partners with Student Loan Planner that people can see at studentloanplanner.com slash private. You know, I, I am a little concerned because I want to make sure that people do not use those unless they are super informed. And that makes me a little nervous to have them on the site. But I think that it makes sense in some cases to use private loans because you can get rid of those ridiculously expensive grad plus loans, start off with a little bit lower interest rate and have your balance grow a little bit less to make it a little easier to refinance. But, you know, the good news is you would have still had a lot of options available to you. I just ran some quick numbers. And uh, as an anesthesiologist, we don't need you to confirm or deny this, but my guess is in a really attractive area to practice where there's tons of demand for anesthesiologists, you might be able to make 350, 400K and then maybe in a less competitive or in a more competitive area where there's more saturation, it might be in the 200s. Is that kind of accurate? I would say that's probably on the low end, to be honest, but you can certainly work with those numbers, yeah. Yeah, so say you made 400K you know, in one of these not-for-profit jobs, you know, then you could have optimized everything to pay about $200 a month on your federal loans, and you actually would have gotten an extra year on that low payment now because the IDR form specifically says, did your income basically decrease during the last tax return? So if, if the answer is... Uh, no, then you just give your tax return and you can certify for an extra year, basically, with a low income. So you probably only would have had to pay on an attending income about three years, probably, towards PSLF of the 10. Okay. And then on top of that, if you'd done the pay-as-you-earn plan, you could be making $500,000 a year and your payments would have been capped at about $2,900 a month, which is what the standard 10-year plan would be for about two fifty k. So sure. the estimate would be that on... 250k you could actually end up paying about 100k if you went for PSLF. So, you know, adjusted for inflation, that's actually not all that different from what you borrowed for loans in 1990 something. Right. So, yeah, we're looking at savings of $150,000 when that's forgiven and that's tax-free forgiveness of course with PSLF. So then you just have to look at the job you took and if you were comparing that to a job in private practice, would you have made an extra 15,000 per year over 10 years, or I guess I should look at maybe 50,000 per year over three years. Correct. But anyway, it's a math game. It's a numbers game. And and uh, you don't necessarily want to take a particular job just for the possibility of loan forgiveness, but you should certainly factor that in, especially if it's only a few more years uh, since you've been paying throughout residency and possibly fellowship already and have you know, some of those 10 years of qualifying payments already made. Right. So you want to come out of retirement, do student loan consults? <laughs> Just kidding. Thanks for no thanks. Yeah, I don't blame you. You know, would you join the military to avoid that 250K? Like, say you were staring that down, would you have thought about it? I don't believe I would have. Because again, if you look at the numbers, now, if you have a, a desire to join the military, irregardless of the numbers, then sure. But I didn't. You owe them four years of your life and uh, the opportunity cost of that. Uh, when you look at military pay versus working for a, a hospital, whether you're in private practice or not, it's pretty substantial. Yeah, that makes sense. Heard it said that it only makes sense to join the military for any profession if that's what you want to do is be a military fill in the blank. Right. And of course, you're told where to live. You will probably be deployed. You know, anyone in the last 20 years who you know, went into anesthesia, probably went to the Middle East at, at some point for 60 or 90 days or more. Yeah, that's not how I wanted to live my life. But I certainly respect those who do. Sure. Would, uh, would you have been an anesthesiologist again? I would, yeah. It was a good career for me. It was, I think, the best fit in medicine after going through all the rotations and kind of figuring out 
what I liked and didn't like about each. I did enjoy that job. What do you think is the best specialty for ROI in terms of years spent for income earned? Yeah, so return on investment of uh, different specialties. Anesthesia was good. I would say dermatology is probably one of the top. Radiation oncology does very well. Emergency medicine, if you're looking at the number of years, there are quite a few three-year residency programs. So you can come out if you went straight through you know, college, med school, residency, you could be 28 or 29 and practicing. And again, if you are willing to work in places that not everyone wants to work, you can make a few hundred dollars an hour. You can work a lot of shifts and you can make quite a bit of money in emergency medicine. So uh, just to show people that it's not all fun and games here, you know, have you ever been sued for millions of dollars? Funny you should ask. And yes, I have. Oh, huh. and it wasn't a malpractice <laughs> suit. It actually had nothing to do with my practice of medicine, although I think having an MD behind my name does put a target on my back. But I was an anesthesiologist at a small hospital that ended up going bankrupt. And as things were starting to look not so rosy, I think it was the uh, vice president of the medical staff went and found another job, which created an opening on the board that I was invited to fill. And so I stepped in as a non-voting member for less than a year before I was let go. And, and then the whole place actually closed down uh, shortly thereafter. And then two years later, I got served a notice that anyone involved with the hospital board was being sued for their personal assets and that the director's and officer's insurance policy that we had didn't cover us in the event of a bankruptcy. So that was uh, my thank you for all of this volunteer time on that board was having my personal assets basically uh, possibly liable to this lawsuit, which I think was frivolous. And it was eventually, I don't know that the lawsuit was dismissed necessarily, but I was dismissed after three and a half years and you know a five figure legal a sum of legal fees. Yeah, it was kind of a nightmare. And it was one of the main reasons that I stayed anonymous with my blogging because that lawsuit was still kind of hanging in the background. That is really terrible. What kind of toll did that take on you psychologically? Well, I have to say that did have something to do with a little bit of a disillusionment, you know, towards medicine being thanked <laughs> with uh, that. Until it went away, it just was always there. I would it would be in the back of my mind, and every month or two, I'd get another bill for you know six hundred dollars here, two thousand dollars there, because there was a phone call or an email or a document you know written up and. I didn't ever think that it was really going to go anywhere. I don't think there was any precedent for, you know, someone in my position, you know, acting in good faith to actually be held accountable for a hospital's bankruptcy. But until it was over, it was one of those things where, well, frankly, I wasn't going to think about actually retiring until I knew that they weren't going to take my money. <laughs> and like I said, I had a, you know, I have a decent amount of money in a taxable brokerage account. And unlike your 401k and maybe a Roth IRA, you know, and this is state by state dependent, but those assets aren't necessarily protected from people that want to take it. Yeah, your retirement's protected, but not your personal assets, right? Yeah, yeah. And again, it's it's going to vary a lot state by state. Yeah, so kind of rule of thumb, always ask if you're ever going to sort of serve on any board if officers are provided director's e &O policies, basically liability insurance. And if the answer is no, you shouldn't serve on the board, right? Absolutely, right. And even if it is provided, I would take a good look at that policy because, again, I had a policy, but it didn't cover bankruptcy. And, well, what's the most likely thing you're going to be sued for in a nonprofit if it goes belly up? Bankruptcy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I probably that e &O carrier probably knew that and probably that's why they didn't include that. It's because they probably assume that that's the most expensive legal problem that they could have to pay for. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. So what are your, some other issues you've seen lead to, obviously, we have a lot more listeners to this podcast than just physicians, but you know, since you are one, what are some reasons you've seen people burn out of the profession of medicine? Yeah, I know the numbers are increasing. I don't know how much of that is maybe better recognition or more willingness to admit you know, how we feel about our profession and our, our uh, current uh, careers, but there's certainly a... Uh, a sort of a corporate uh, mentality creeping in more and more to the hospital 
setting and more administration dictating what the physicians do and how they take care of patients. And so that lack of autonomy that a lot of people are sensing becoming more and more prominent has has been a real issue. And of course, it's just the, you know, the bureaucracy is the red tape, having to get prior authorizations for insurance companies to pay for inhaler for a kid with asthma, you know, which might take an hour on the phone sometimes from what I hear. All sorts of things that I just aren't part of what we train to do, the reasons we went into medicine, but we end up spending more of our time doing and uh, it, it gets to be frustrating. Yeah. So I think a lot of people that I've seen like getting burned out have cut their hours back and that's fixed the problem. I mean, have you seen something similar? Right. And when I came out, I was like, this is a great job and I'm getting paid when I did locum tenens work, which is temporary work by the hour. So I worked a lot of hours. You know, in hindsight, I probably should have taken more time off, but I kind of looked at a day off as a, as a uh, kind of like spending the money I could have made. And so, yeah, I think the hours that we either choose to put in or have to put in because that's what doctors do, work 60 plus hours a week. That can be a real issue when you're now in your 30s, just starting your career and also starting a family and dealing with the, the stresses of not only your job, but everyday life. So in terms of our student loan borrowers listening, in terms of achieving a life like yours, or at least you know hitting this level of financial independence where you don't have to work anymore, so the big difference is you can either pay your debt off or you can go for forgiveness. And of course, you know that you can go for the PSLF 10-year forgiveness or you can do the 20 or 25-year version where there's income tax due at the end of, on that balance that's forgiven. You've heard about that, right, Leif? I have. I saw your guest post on the White Coat Investor discussing that exact topic. Yeah. What that ends up working out to is after all the deductions and all the math and everything, the student loan payment at the very worst case scenario, if it's federal, ends up about being approximately 7 or 8% of your income, your AGI specifically, right? Adjusted gross income. So that's basically mm-hmm. a tax. It's it's technically 10%, but there's a little bit of a deduction involved, which is why it ends up being 7 or 8. Okay. You got about 7 or 8% going to your student loan. And so if you're doing PSLF, that's all you're losing. If you're doing one of the 20 or 25-year programs, then you have an additional you know, seven or eight percent that needs to go away into mutual funds to cover your tax bomb. That's approximately the number that it works out to. So, in other words, you know, you've got seven or eight percent going to your student loans with the PSLF case, about fifteen percent going to your student loans plus your tax bomb for the taxable case, and then you've got you know your payment that you're just making a flat monthly payment if you're paying it off, and maybe you're paying a lot. You know, maybe you're paying way more than you know fifteen percent of your income because you're trying to get out of debt in five years or less. But that's kind of how the cost of student debt works, right? So in other words, somebody who you know has 400000 of student loans and who's a veterinarian making 100000 a year, they're going to lose 15% of their income to their student loans. And then the other $85,000 left over, they'll have available for pursuing financial independence. So what advice would you give to somebody that's going to lose 15% of their income to their student loans because of these forgiveness programs that still wants to achieve financial independence from uh, how lowering that that spending number can lower the asset number that you need to get and also you just how you would go about increasing those assets to get to that level of, of spending. Sure, that's a tricky one, but I like to tell people or, or challenge people, I should say, to try to live on half of their take-home pay. Now, I tend to speak to high-income professionals, so that's you know oftentimes still living on a, a maybe a low six-figure not income, but living on a six-figure spend per year. But if you're making $100,000 a year and losing $15,000 to student loans, now you're down to 85. Can you live on $40,000 a year? Depends on where you live. Depends on you know your family and and other certainly other factors. But people do it. It certainly can be done, and and you can be. I think you can be reasonably happy with a roof over your head and a car that doesn't leak and everything else. Two or three bedrooms, like you described. So I have a question for you, though, that it kind of popped up when you were describing the whole situation. Would there be a good reason to retire early before that tax bomb hit so that you had no additional income when you have the uh, tax due on the loan forgiveness or maybe even taking a sabbatical year so that in that tax year that you have the tax bomb, 
uh, you're filling up low brackets with at least some of that money. You're absolutely correct. Yes. I mean, that's one reason why we try to push people to do financial independence that are going for this forgiveness strategy is because they would have the ability to take, you know, a couple of years off from work with this big hit to their income taxes all at once. And then you're going to get taxed instead of 40 or 50%, you might only get taxed at, you know, 20, 25%, right? Right. Yeah. Instead of paying marginal yeah. on it. Um, if you're marginal to zero, then you start at zero and then fill up the 10%, 12%, 22%, 24% brackets. Yeah. Right. And you, and you could even make an argument that you could relocate to a foreign country for a year and get a $100,000 exemption for the foreign income tax exclusion. So you could not only fill up lower brackets, you could also exempt maybe 100 or 200 grand if you're married potentially off of that additionally. So you could make that tax bomb almost go away with some really careful planning if you've saved a whole bunch of money. you know. So yeah, that's absolutely something that we definitely talk to people about. And you have to suffer through a year in uh, Costa Rica to do that, huh? Yeah. Wow. you know, Or you know, <laughs> just Costa Rica and Europe and the Asia. Like, you know, I traveled all over the place when I tried early retirement when I was 25, which, you know, yeah. I, was kind of, I was kind of looking back, I was kind of foolish, but it actually ended up working out. And that's another great point is both you and myself for both people that are still earning significant income after our early retirement plans were realized, right? Right. I would argue that you do whatever you want. So you can travel whenever you want. So I think you're a little bit more retired than I am. I would argue mostly just because of I'm trying to support my wife's career. So I don't uh, have the same travel flexibility for somebody that still wants to be in medicine, right? Exactly. And I think we all want to be productive in some way, shape or form, you know, whether or not that's starting a business or you know, running a blog or just raising kids. But yeah. Yeah, but there, there is that desire that most of us have, especially the people that are industrious enough to get to a position of financial independence early. So yeah, I say retire early and often. Right. So, you know, you can earn money by like doing things that you would otherwise have to pay people to do to watch your kids or have them, uh, you know, do, you know, get tutoring or, you know, so you, a lot of those things you can do if you have the time. Right. So that reduces your spending needs and then cooking your own food because you don't working 65 hours a week. That's another thing that you could save money on in retirement. And then also, you know, the ability to um, make money doing other things like we're both doing. So I think that most people, in my opinion, the the 4% withdrawal rate for your investments, I think in my opinion is actually very low. I think that uh, I don't want to advocate this, but I think if you're in your 30s or 40s, I think that you could get by on a 10% withdrawal rate uh, which sounds totally terrible to suggest to people, but the reason is because I'm very confident that you will find something that you enjoy doing that just happens to make an income. Right. You probably want to maybe find that thing though before you go up to that 10% uh, number. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't retire on uh, 200,000 and plan to spend. Well, that's not a good number. That's true. Um, I mean, like, I wouldn't well, retire on a million, plan to spend 100,000 unless I had already been successful in finding that next thing. Thing. Right. Well, like what I would tell somebody is if you have two years of expenses in the bank, so 200000 in cash for that person that spends 100 k a year. Would you call that FU money? Yeah, but probably. Yeah. And so then you'd have the 200000 in cash plus the million dollars. That would be something that I would feel comfortable with telling somebody that they could go retire. And the reason for that is because I think it takes you a year to kind of recover from all of the like mental exhaustion of doing something that you weren't in love with. And then I think it takes you another year to try out things and not feel the pressure of having them to have to be successful. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm partly going off of what my own timetable looked like, but you know, by year three, I was really doing something that was making, you know, a significant amount of money. So I don't know. I think that people need to consider getting to 10 times their spending and then consider taking a big risk with their lifestyle, be that reducing their hours, trying out a new career they never thought about trying before, as long as they can get back into their old one, if it doesn't work out. Taking more risk, I would love to see people take more risk in life, because I think a lot of people are kind of stuck in jobs that are not fulfilling them and not producing a high enough income, you know, where it's worth sacrificing your time for money, and they're afraid to go out there and try different things. And as a student loan borrower, you can take that risk, because the worst case scenario is your student loan is a tax on your income. When a lot of people don't think like that. Yeah. We're kind of coming up close on the hour here. Do you have any indulgences or luxuries that you waste money on? Well, waste is probably not the term I would use, but we talked about it. We, we do like to travel and uh, that does cost money. It would be cheaper to stay home, but we want to see the world and we want to show that to our kids and we want them to uh, have a uh, you know more well-rounded, maybe that's not the best word, but just to be aware that... Uh, you know, there are many different cultures and many ways in which people live around the world and to actually see that and live that for themselves. You know, I do like to uh, buy good beer from time to time. 
Yeah, follow-up question for that. What's your craziest investment you've ever made and how liquid was it? Um, that's a good question. So about eight years ago, we invested in a brewery in that same small town where we were living. And it turned out that whole hospital bankruptcy thing happened shortly thereafter. So I didn't get to uh, enjoy this quite as much as I would have liked to. But we invested in a craft brewery, put in $20,000, owned 4% of the business. And whenever we'd go back, which we actually do have a little cabin, which is another splurge. We have a second home, which is uh, just a little place in an old resort, but it's uh, it's near this brewery. And whenever we'd go back there, we could stop in the brewery, act like we own the place. And uh, there was a policy where we got two free beers whenever we stopped in the tap room. And so uh, in that regard, it was very liquid in that uh, the dividends were free beer, which is a liquid and a tasty one at that. <laughs> and on the other hand, of course, as an investment, it was not at all liquid. We would call that an illiquid investment because I couldn't easily sell my shares or I didn't want to either. Although truthfully, there was a way that we could sell them to other investors and they probably would have bought and it would have been a, a good buy because I'm just now learning that the brewery will be sold soon and I believe we'll get a pretty darn good return on our investment. It should beat out the VTSAX uh, that I've also been investing in. I was thinking about the yield on that 20000 So 4% rules, $800 of income from that a year. Did you get $800 worth of beer per year out of that? Well, the first few years, they had some capital calls where we had to pay more money in. And so Ooh. I put in another, uh, I think, 30, almost 35% of that initial investment in to keep the brewery going and to buy new equipment. But the last three to four years, we actually got a dividend check of 4% exactly. Hmm. Plus the free beer, yeah. which saved uh, dozens of dollars per summer, maybe even hundreds. Yeah. So for investments like that, you could, you'd only want to do those when you're financially independent, probably. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's play money, you know, like yeah. I think it's good to invest in a pretty simple way, you know, buy index funds and et cetera. But, you know, five to 10% of your money can be, you know, what we call play money, where you make investments that may not be the most sound and you can afford to lose. And that was one of those. Makes sense. Now, uh, can you share with our audience your charitable mission and, and you know, maybe how you've uh, given back? Yeah. So like I said, I do make some money now with the physician on fire. And I started that after having already achieved financial independence and it didn't feel right to put advertisements on the site or have referral links on my site if I was telling people I didn't need more money. That's kind of the whole point of financial independence. And so I have a charitable mission with the blog where I donate half of my profits. And I don't donate all the profits because I like to have some skin in the game. I think I work a lot harder to reach more people and have more of an effect with the site by having uh, some profit for myself. But yeah, we donate half of the profits. And on a personal level, I've also traveled a couple of times to do some medical mission work as an anesthesiologist before I retired from that profession. And I went to a place that allowed us to take our family and they had different volunteer jobs they could do on site as well, which was a really rewarding uh, experience for us all. So any uh, last suggestions for people with six figures of student loans that are interested in pursuing this financial independence journey? And this is before we ask you where people can find you. Okay, yeah. Well, uh, of course, if you haven't, consider a consult from studentloanplanner.com. <laughs> also, I didn't have six figures, although inflation adjusted, it was probably darn close if you actually did the math, which I have not done. But it's just slow and steady. You know, that's what you need to, uh, you know, make some goals, pay your loans off gradually or work your way towards PSLF and make sure you send in the proper paperwork and do the uh, all the things you need to do to qualify. But don't plan on this happening in the short term. Just know what your goals are. Make sure that your actions are aligned with those goals. Like I said, try to live on half your take-home pay. If your take-home pay will support you in the place that you're living. And if you do that, you can become financially independent when starting from zero in about 15 years. If you're starting from negative 300,000, it might be closer to 20 years, but it can happen. Yeah. You might have to leave that $200,000 a year job in the middle of downtown LA and take a job in rural Minnesota and make 500000 a year. That might be part of it, right? That you can live in a $100,000 house instead of a million dollar house. <laughs> That's a win-win, right? Geographic arbitrage you have, and this is kind of unique to the medical profession, but higher pay in lower cost of living areas. Whereas in finance or big law, you, know, 
know, you need to be in the big cities where it costs more to make that good money. But it's the inverse in medicine. And uh, that is something that we took advantage of, not by design necessarily. My wife and I are both from small towns in Minnesota and Michigan. And so we came back to the Midwest where we grew up and where we wanted to be. But that turned out to be a good financial strategy as well. Cool. Where can people find you, Leif? Physicianonfire.com. You can just type in pofire.com. That'll get you there. And I'm on Twitter, pretty active. I've got a couple of Facebook groups. One's for physicians, simply called Physicians on Fire, and one called Fat Fire for everyone else who wants to be financially independent and also have a fairly generous budget in retirement. Awesome. And all those resources can be found at studentloanplanner.com slash 49, which is the number of today's episode. And you can also check out studentloanplanner.com slash podcast to see the show notes for all of our episodes. Leif, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me, Travis. It was awesome. 